Good evening and welcome to Light of the Desert. My name is Paul Whitcup and we're so happy that you have chosen to join us online as we begin this three-day service and observance of Holy Week. Tonight we're observing Monday Thursday and on this night we remember and celebrate the final supper that Jesus shared with his disciples. It was a Passover Seder when the people of Israel remembered what God had done 1,500 years earlier when he freed them from their slavery to Egypt. But this supper, this last supper, was much more. Jesus taught about love, and he modeled it for us. Tonight, we observe the supper. Tomorrow night, we will observe Good Friday, when Jesus was nailed to a cross to die for the sin of the world, and to die for my sin and your sin. And then on Sunday, we finish this three-day story as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection and his victory over sin and death. We'll be observing communion tonight and on Easter, and we invite you to participate as you might need to gather your elements so that we can celebrate them together. Uh, the service begins as we remember the account of God's liberation of the Hebrew children from Egypt. The reading is from Exodus 12, verses 1 through 7. While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat, with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The, this plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is a day to remember each year from generation to generation. You must celebrate it as a fe special festival to the Lord, this is a law for all time. Please join me now in a time of confessing our sins together. Jesus, you loved us, and you loved us to the end. Even on the night when you were betrayed, you took a towel and washed our feet. We confess that we are reluctant to think of you doing such a humble task, least of all for us. Humble us and give us the heart of Jesus. We have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us and remind us of the grace of Jesus. You showed a different way, Jesus, towel bearer, foot washer, cross carrier, You've set an example, and we long to lead, follow you wherever you lead us. Humble us to receive the gift of your amazing and generous grace. Let's take a moment now to acknowledge our need for God and confess the ways that we fall short of his plan.
hear the good news of the assurance of our forgiveness. Each of us was born with a sin disease that deserves death. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus paid the price for our sin, past, present, and future. He is the Passover lamb, and through him God gives us the gifts of forgiveness, new life, and the always present Holy Spirit. These gifts are free and cannot be earned. They come to us by faith. We receive this good news by the authority of God's word. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this night, nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus turned the final corner in his journey to the cross, a mission that would result in our salvation. His time as a teacher and mentor to his disciples would end in just a few shorter hours, and he couldn't waste any of it. Jesus' most important teaching was about to happen. In that lesson, he would proclaim his absolute divinity in an act of utter humility. Over the previous three years, Jesus had taken the 12 disciples through a carefully planned training program. For rabbis and their disciples, this was not an unusual progression. In the culture of first century Jews, a rabbi would gather a set of disciples and those students would follow that rabbi everywhere. They would soak up the rabbi's teachings and they would emulate the life of the rabbi and all of the rabbi's habits. They would dress like the rabbi. They would try to talk like the rabbi. They would adopt many of the rabbi's mannerisms if they could. Ideally, once they had succeeded in making themselves nearly a clone of their rabbi, they would add their own twist and set off to be a rabbi of themselves. The rabbi was the top of the social order. People respected the rabbis, and the rabbis had an expectation of how they were to be treated by others. 
Even poor rabbis had the assurance of the adoration of their community. If you were not born of noble birth or of family wealth, to be a rabbi was about the only way you could climb the social ladder. Every man wanted to be a rabbi. In many ways, you might say that Jesus was normal, as rabbis go. His desire was for his disciples to soak up his teachings and to emulate his habits. What made him so different was the content of his teachings and how counter-social his habits were. Now, I've shared many times over the last few months that I'm a Boy Scout. My father was a Boy Scout. My son is a Scout. One of the principles that is taught in the scouting program is that you lead by example. There are two reasons for this as an effective leadership strategy. The first, scouts are much more likely to follow a leader that's willing to get their hands dirty along with them. Adolescent males don't respond too well to a leader that's too good to work. The second reason is that a leader that demonstrates how to do a task is effectively training the younger scouts. Jesus had been leading by example for the last three years. He would explain, demonstrate, guide, and ultimately enable his disciples through each of his lessons. On this night, Jesus would explain and illustrate his most important teaching. On Friday, he would demonstrate it. Tonight, we're going to explore the Apostle John's account of the last night Jesus spent with his disciples. Throughout John's Gospel, he hints that he believes that you've probably already read one or all of the previous Gospel accounts. So, this allows him to focus on other aspects of Jesus' ministry. The setting is the upper room. They were gathered to share the Passover feast when John writes this in chapter 13. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave the world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Jesus, no, Peter protested. You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed then, Wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, A person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Let's begin with the spiritual implication of Jesus' teaching. He works his way around the table and he lands at Peter who objects to what's happening. You will never ever wash my feet, he says. When Jesus tells Peter that it is necessary, then Peter swings to the other extreme. This is where Jesus makes his point. A person who has bathed all over does not need to wash 
except for the feet. This imagery is very important for us to catch. The disciples have been transformed by Jesus' teachings. They are, with one exception, all spiritually clean and nearly equipped to begin their individual ministries. But they are still human. Their lives, no matter how heavenly influenced, are still grounded in this world. And what part of the body does, has most frequent contact with the world? Our feet. Quite literally, Jesus is saying that this is where the rubber meets the road. The sins of the disciples have already been forgiven, but so long as we walk in this world, the stain of sin will always attempt to cling to us. And where do we intersect with the road? But our feet. In order to stay clean in the rest of the body, we must let Jesus wash our feet. When we fail to repent and submit to the healing gift of God, then in a matter of time, that filth will creep its way up and over us. Jesus is teaching us, in part, that we must be attentive to how the world clings to us all so long as we're walking in it. The second point is the reality of Jesus' illustration. The roads in the Roman Empire were not freshly laid asphalt, nightly swept with street cleaners, trying to polish things down to a like new shine. No, they were mostly dirt, and they were not just used by pedestrians, but also horses, donkeys, and every manner of livestock on their way to market. That means dirt and excrement of every form and flavor. The world can be a filthy place, and the sin that sticks to our feet stinks. That brings us to the third point, an illustration that highlights why Jesus was unlike any other rabbi ever. For obvious reasons, the task of washing the feet of a guest goes to the lowest slave in a household. It is possibly the worst task that you could be assigned, not merely because it involved scrubbing dung off of somebody's already smelly feet, but you have to pretend not to be disgusted by it. Yet Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, not only humbles himself to the task, but does so in joy, motivated by his love for all of his disciples, even the one that could not be made clean by the mere washing of his feet. The lesson was simple and poignant. All of us have filthy feet. And if you want to be a rabbi like Jesus, you need to be willing to wash those feet. John wanted to emphasize something else here. Jesus' desire to humbly serve us is completely voluntary. That is to say that at any moment, it was in Jesus' power to take a different track. John does not want us to get the impression that Jesus was somehow uh, a willing victim of circumstance, that at some point he was past the point of no return. Let's jump to, to chapter 18 for just a moment and see what John has to say about the account of Jesus' arrest. We're going to start at verse 3, and it reads like this. The leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now, with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. There's something that gets lost in translation. We read Jesus' response to the soldiers, I am he. In the Greek, the literal translation is simply, I am, which kind of sounds silly, but it's not. In the third chapter of Exodus, Moses asked the burning bush, Who shall I say sent me? And God replies, telling him to say, I am the I am. Sometimes it's translated to sound a little bit more like Popeye. I am who I am. 
in Exodus, though, what he's saying is that I exist. I am real. I am here. That's what God was communicating to Moses. And Jesus is doing the exact same thing. In his answer, he is saying, I am the living God. And if we, as the readers, have any doubt of the power that comes with that declaration, John tells us that the entire company of soldiers was pushed to the ground. Depending upon, again, translation, the original word was cohort, which would be 600 soldiers. And in Jesus' is saying, I am, they were all pushed down. The Son of God had the power to take a different path. But for our sake and for our salvation, He chose to humble Himself and pay the ransom for our sins. And in doing so, asserted His power over death itself. This was and remains the most unmatched act of humility that the Creator of the universe would allow Himself to descend to the lowest station possible. On that Thursday night, Jesus gave us the most important teaching in a graphic illustration. On Friday, He would demonstrate the full extent of His love in His ultimate act of humility. So what are we to take from this? First, we must never imagine that we are entitled to anything. If the creator of the universe is not above serving the lowest of the low, then none of us are either. We must never imagine ourselves to be of higher station than anyone else. We, in fact, are all travelers on the same roads. We are all children of the same God, bought and paid for by the same Christ. The second is this. We cannot give away that which we have not first received. We cannot speak of salvation if we ourselves aren't saved. And the world is constantly going to be sticking to us, smelling things up. And so that means we have to regularly let Jesus wash our feet. In the next three days, let us fully embrace what Jesus has done for us. Let us fully realize the extent of His love and the truth of His identity. Let us learn to follow His example and let us proclaim His divinity to all this world by practicing His humility in everything we do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we step through this evening and imagine what it was like for You and the disciples as You were betrayed, help open our eyes to fully appreciate the lesson You are teaching us. Help us accept that so long as we walk in this place, the filth of the world will climb its way up our feet, but that You constantly come back to us to restore us and to heal us and to make us whole and clean. Lord, teach us these lessons and grant us the strength and courage to share Your love in the world around us. In Jesus' name, Amen.
this evening. God, I thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, to save us, to rescue us from the ways that we mess up every single day. And God, we do get to praise you. We do get to thank you every single day with our lives because of what you did for us. And I just pray that that would become so real to us. It would become something that we just live knowing, resting assured that you, your son, has paid the price for our sin. God, we thank you. Right now, I just want to lift up anyone who is hurting, anyone who may be feeling the weight of the world on their shoulders with the circumstances that are going on right now. God, I pray that we would all just Breathe in your presence, your presence of peace. God, it says in your word that you go with us no matter where we go. And so I pray that we would rest in that promise. God, I pray for those who are sick right now. I pray that you would just bring healing into their lives. God, I pray for those who are on the front lines of, bi of battling this coronavirus. God, I pray that that you would protect them, keep them safe. God, equip them with what they need to battle on the front lines. Lord, we just pray expectantly for what you are going to do through this time. We know that you work all things for good. And so we pray that over this situation right now, God. Let us keep our eyes fixed on you in these circumstances, but especially as we are remembering your death and ultimately your resurrection. Help us keep our eyes fixed on you, that you are victorious, that you conquered the grave. Help us live thankfully for that, God. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. May God's peace be with each and every one of us, no matter where we are, we are a family, no matter how physically separated that we may be at this time. May God's peace be with you. Tonight we're going to celebrate communion. In his message, Pastor Bill described for us the night that Jesus gathered his best friends together and celebrated this meal that really established this meal for us to celebrate often now into the future. The reading from John that he read tells us that in this verse that I, I just absolutely love, that he tells us that Jesus had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And it says, now he loved them to the very end. And he did the unthinkable that night. He washed their feet. And this was a task that only a servant would do which is precisely what Jesus was modeling for them. He had told them several times during his times with them that following him was going to be about serving. Even he came not to be served, but to serve. And now he said, here is my commandment, love each other. How? Love each other as I have loved you. He says, by this will all people know that you are my followers, if you love each other. 
At this time, I want to invite you to gather the communion elements for tonight's celebration. You might find some bread, either something you baked or another kind of bread or a cracker. And then I invite you to find a cup. It might be a chalice like this one or some other special cup that, that, that you have in your cupboards. And so you can pour some wine or grape juice or even water into it. We'll celebrate the meal with each person first receiving a piece of the bread and then a piece, uh, take the piece of bread and dip it into, into the cup. You might want to push pause right now if you need time to gather your elements. We read about this meal in Matthew chapter 26. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? And he replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, You have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it into pieces, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Again, he took a cup of wine, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them, and he said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. And then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. I invite you to please take this time now to serve each other and allow each person enough time, and then afterwards we will pray the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, as we read this account from Matthew of what happened after the meal that night, we will be removing all the pyramids, the elements of communion, and the symbols from the altar, stripping it until it is bare. This is to help us remember that on this night, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was unjustly arrested, accused, and stripped of his dignity and left to spend the night alone in jail. A reading from Matthew chapter 26, verses 31 to 56. On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter declared, Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. Then Jesus went with him to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. But the spirit is willing and the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. Then he returned to them again. He found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, My friend, go ahead and do what you have come to do. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? But if I did, 
how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there, teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled.